this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are talking some college football for week number four by talking to Pamela Maldonado of Yahoo, getting her thoughts on this week's games, the marquee matchups, and her favorite bets of the week. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. We are back to talking college football, Ed. And a good time to do so because you live in Ann Arbor, and it's a a fun time to be in Ar- Ann Arbor right now because Michigan not looking too bad. How you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, Michigan looks pretty good, and a lot of the top teams in college football don't look that good at all. I I, I still like Alabama, even though they uh, just squeaked it out at Florida. But you know, Clemson looks like they have some serious issues on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, Ohio State has some issues on the defensive side of the ball. Oklahoma doesn't look that great. And it's going to be an interesting year. So as I was watching games on Saturday, I definitely had this thought that, you know, you know, I turned on that Ohio State game to see see if they if Tulsa could pull it off. They they couldn't. But the margin was certainly padded by uh, a pick six at the end. And and uh, yeah, so I I, I thought about tweeting out just kind of this whole chaos situation on Saturday. And I was like, eh, I'm going to hold off. But then, of course, Bill Conley on Monday morning, you know, has an article right. talking about the chaos situation and and talking about Michigan in the playoff. And, and Michigan looked good uh, against Northern Illinois. And from an analytics perspective, you know, we move a little bit more on college football teams through three games than we ever should in the NFL, right? Mm-hmm. So Super Bowl contenders is playing badly through through three games and just kind of squeaking by. You know, it's a long season with regression to the mean and, and their skill level, you know, they're probably going to regress to where, where we had them in the preseason, mm-hmm. but college football teams change so much. Uh, there, there are a lot of different things can happen. And even people around here are starting to forget uh, the two and four disaster that, that Michigan had last year, seeing that Jim Bar- Harbaugh seems to have this team doing pretty well. Um, I had a lot of questions about whether the defensive coordinator hire was, was the right move. Uh, I thought it was a move that he had to get right so far. Right. So good. So again, but it's also only three games as well. But you know, Michigan's up to tenth in my numbers right now. Uh, the Michigan predictions have been pretty closely tracking the market. Uh, I have Michigan as a sixteen-point favorite over Rutgers. The markets are in excess of twenty right now. There have been some injuries, suspensions with Rutgers, um, but I kind of don't think that number is coming down. Yeah. And- so it'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm very interested to see where that closes. But but. Um, I don't know. I I don't think that's coming down. I don't think it's coming down to where where my number is. Uh, you were talking about Bill Connolly, and I was reading the SP Plus rankings earlier this week, and I was surprised to see Michigan sixth because of what you alluded to with what happened last year. So I think that that probably makes you feel better about putting them tenth in your numbers, uh, seeing Bill Connolly have them up in sixth. And I think that what you said about the preseason priors is interesting because we'll talk to Pamela about this as well later on, but like. For me, that's the tough thing that I've had. That I've had to like decide, okay, how much do I want to factor it in with my NFL numbers as we get deeper into the year? And like you said, I have had that anchor pretty firmly in for a lot of stuff. But like, it, it is tough to decide how much we want to go with. And I, I think that with college, it's a very different situation, as you said. Yeah, it's a very different situation. And, you know, I think Bill actually has Michigan as like, I mean, basically has it 50-50 at Wisconsin next week. Uh, my numbers are not that optimistic. I think I'd have them as about a five or Michigan would be about a five or six point underdog when you, when mm-hmm. you factor in the home field after that, but we still got a week of football to play. So we'll see, see what happens. Michigan getting into big 10 play and obviously yeah. Wisconsin with the, the huge matchup versus Notre Dame in Chicago. And we're going to talk about that game with Pamela Maldonado. You can find her on Twitter at Pamela M 35. She of course is a betting analyst and writer for Yahoo. We'll be talking to her about her new gig uh, later on today. We're also going to preview week number four of college football and talk about her favorite bets for this week. If you're looking for the NFL show for this week, that is coming up tomorrow. Ariel Epstein is going to join us of sports grid and talk about the best bets across the NFL for week number three. 
check out some big games on the board, but also talk to Ariel about player props because we talked to her about NBA player props last year. And she also bets like defensive player props, which blows my mind because I can never do that. So we'll talk to her about that and get her thoughts on week number three to get that as it goes live. Make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast Just search for covering the spread on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google podcasts, whatever it may be. Hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review if you like what you hear. So NFL coming up tomorrow, which will include covering the past, going back through week number two across the NFL. We'll talk to Pamela about week four of college football in just one second. But first, hey, football fans, FanDuel is giving you the opportunity to bet on the third week of the NFL season. All you have to do is go to FanDuelSportsbook.com or download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Place a three-plus leg parlay wager on any week three NFL game. And if your bet loses, get a refund and site credit. Max refund $10. Bet on week three of the NFL season with FanDuel by heading over to FanDuel Sportsbook today and placing a risk-free NFL parlay. Must be 21-plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Refund issued as a non throttle site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $10. Restrictions apply. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Say, uh... Uh, same game parlay available for multiple sports in all states on mobile web. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. Covering the present. Let's bring Pamela Maldonado back into covering the spread to talk about some college football for week number four. Pamela, first of all, congratulations are in order. This is uh, first time we've spoken to you since you uh, went on full time with Yahoo. Congrats on that. How's it going so far? Thank you so much. It's a company that I definitely am appreciative to be with. Um, the crew is great. We have an editing team, a social team. So it's a big change of pace. I really love it because I can knock out so much content <laughs> and knocking out content. I love to do it. So. Happy to yeah. be with Yahoo. Well, it's well-deserved. Uh, happy to see that happening. How has NFL and, and college football season been going for you so far? College football has been fantastic, to say the least, through three weeks. First off, I can't believe we're in week four already. I know, right? flying by. But through the first three weeks, I've correctly predicted 10 out of 12 underdog outright wins. Wow. So making some plus money uh, through that. Um, the two underdogs that I missed, I had they were 14-point underdogs. Lesson learned. They're not on my card this week, um, but that's college football and then NFL. I'm holding my own. My teasers are doing well, and my player props are kind of sticking around, and we'll see what happens with those. And you said the NFL was not previous and something that you were, you know, super jazzed, but how's the transition been for you in trying to add on NFL? Because I know they're like, you know, when we're working for companies, they will ask us to do NFL because mm -hmm. everyone has to do NFL stuff like that. How have you felt the transition has gone for you in – you know, trying to really beef up the NFL because obviously college, it sounds like you're you're already set there. Yeah, college I'm honed in, but that's because that's my bread and butter. I've been doing that for years. I've been born and raised in Texas and Texas <laughs> is anything but college. So NFL, <laughs> I've actually um, didn't start. I never watched if it didn't happen. If it happened before 2016, I have mm -hmm. no idea what happened in the NFL because I didn't watch <laughs> NFL until 2016. When my buddy was like, hey, you're so good at college, do this NFL contest with me. And I was like, what? I don't, I just, I don't do NFL. He's like, it's the same thing. You're fine. It is not the same thing. And I am not fine. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely different. And every year I've tried to tweak how I look at NFL. And you kind of have to ignore the stats and the analytics and kind of run with what you saw the week before. And really do focus on overreactions and underreactions and situational spots and divisional games. Like I think there's a lot more intuitive rather than like relying on numbers in NFL. And it's taken me a while to figure that out. So I'm finding my niche and my niche is kind of more with player props and with uh, now will the season I'm doing well with NFL teasers. So I'm kind of fine. That's what people need to do is once you know you're good at something and stick to that and kind of avoid everything else. So like totals, they're so hard in the NFL. So I don't touch them. <laughs> And the good thing yeah. is you've found that niche in college football already, because basically what you do is you're very numbers based in college. We talked to you last year. You're talking about trying to identify team strengths and team weaknesses and saying, okay, where does a strength match with the opposing team's weakness? 
and obviously it's been very successful for you. Right. The issue that I would run into is that this time of year, it's tough because we got varying competition levels and stuff like that. And, and we're mm. looking at numbers trying to identify what those strengths are, what those weaknesses are. So which numbers do you lean on this time of year specifically when you're trying to identify what those strengths and weaknesses are? I think right now entering week four, we're kind of focusing more on the strength of schedule. A team is 3-0, and and we've seen that in the Big Ten. There's six 3-0 teams. Well, there's a few of those 3-0 teams who have made two MAC teams and a couple of FCS teams, and now you're about to face another SEC opponent or another big, like, good luck. You're going to get, <laughs> you know, like, thro- uh, tramped on, tra- trampled on, and you kind of have to look at, okay, well, in, is it is 3-0, like, legit, or are we going to start to see what the true colors are? And so it's a lot of weariness going on right now. We're in between – the early weeks where we have our data, but it's not necessarily strong entering conference competition. So you have to kind of use some of that intuition intuition and say, okay, well, this big SEC team is going to crush this little nobody team, <laughs> even if they did face um, lesser opponents, but because the, the SEC teams are just like bigger, they're bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. And it's just unfortunate, but it's the kind of truth of the case when you start looking at recruiting numbers and all of that. So I'm always going to look at strength versus weakness. And that always starts first with the pass rush versus offensive line. So through three weeks, you already have a good pretty sample size of who has a terrible offensive line and Florida state, they still do. <laughs> Any, they still do. So you kind of look at the opponents that they're facing, well, are they even in the top 20, top 25, even top 50 for the pass rush? And are they going to be able to generate some of that quarterback pressure? And that could come into play. So keep it simple. And that's always like my first go-to stat, pass rush, offensive line. Excellent. So, so Pam, you know, we're, we're through three weeks. And, you know, how eager are you to get off your preseason prior, right? I mean, you've studied up on these teams. Um, how you, would you call yourself very eager to get off or do you try to remember, you know, what we thought about these teams three weeks ago? Um, I'm still, I'm in that, I'm in that great area as well when it comes to college, because I was really high on Iowa entering the season. And so far they're showing me and preseason, I said, this is a team that can win the big 10 title. And it's not going to be because of their offense. It's going to be the defense that wins games. Well, here we are entering week four. And that's exactly what's been happening. Their defense is absolutely crushing. I do need to see more from this offense if I think they're going to be like a playoff contender, but I think that's something that can be built into. But as long as you have a strong offensive, strong defense that can definitely handle that, uh, put some, apply some quarterback pressure, take, have some takeaways, you become, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but like 2020, uh, this season, 2021, we don't really have a lot of strong anything we don't really have like a strong Heisman contender we don't have a strong like playoff contender it's kind of like everyone's kind of base level right now and I think that really does open up the door for teams like Iowa to not have such a strong offense because their defense is so good and that becomes different than what we're used to high-powered explosive offenses so you're having to kind of balance that idea from preseason where we all thought it was going to be Clemson and DJ Uwagalele who's going to crush and then well they're not and so now <laughs> so now you have these pre uh, pre notions preseason of like these offenses are going to do well nobody is really doing well jumping off the page so now this opens up the door for I have to backtrack everything and now look at it from a defensive perspective which is something that we're just not used to doing yeah absolutely i mean i think i still put alabama i i, I think alabama is going to be there at the end of the year when when all is said and done but it's really the the fall off of those other teams the clemson's the ohio states right. ohio state particularly on defense just because they had those issues last year mm-hmm. um and yeah it's going to be it's i mean you know, a lot of people are kind of writing about the, the chaos this year. And I, I definitely agree that that's what we're going to see. Now, one Which thing makes I think it a lot more interesting. I'm happy to not see the same Clemson, the same Alabama, the same. Right. I'm happy to see, see a little bit of change. It opens yeah. up the door for a team like Oregon to come in. It comes opens right. up the door for an Iowa. It opens up the door for maybe even K-State. Do I want to say that? I mean, they're doing really well. Like, on all of these are defensive, are defense first teams, and they're winning games because of a defense lacking in the offense. So, yeah. I mean, I I'm open for the chaos. I love it. Bring it on. It yeah. changes things up a bit. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly that like it's going to be like a defensive kind of year, but I do think it's a year that we're not going to see Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State as a 14 point favorite in their conference championship games like that. Yeah. That's probably not happening this year. And I, I think that's 
going to be great. And that alone yeah. keeps things interesting. Yeah. One thing you'd mentioned before, Pamela, is that you had had these big underdogs who are trying to bet to, you know, see if they cover, you know, like a 14 point spread. And you made a video about that for Yahoo this week, talking about identifying your weaknesses and tracking your bets. So you can decide which markets you want to go into. I want to talk about the flip side of that. You know, you're tracking your bets. You know where you excel. What have been your strengths? What have been your most advantageous markets for you this year? And why do you think you've done well, been well equipped to handle those specific markets? The games that I've done best on, like I said, I had 10 outright underdog money lines, and all of those were five points or less. So those are the markets that I'm looking at, the, the games that are two and a half to seven point spreads. And I think that it's a lot of misconception of like, oh, it's such a small spread. It's like the NFL. If you're only giving me two and a half with the Chiefs or like six and a half at home with the Chiefs, I'm going to take the best quarterback. This is college, and there's a huge difference in road splits and home sl home splits. You see it more often than not in college because these players are still developing their skill set, and they're a lot better at home than they are on the road. And so you kind of have to look for those types of weaknesses. Um, and I think it is a lot more intuitive. Of, I've just been watching college football for years, and I know like it's a lot of them still have the same head coaches. So you're, the players may change, but the coaching schemes are still pretty much the same, and you kind of become familiarized with – what coaches like to do with their offensive schemes, both home and on the road. And I think we're also seeing a big difference with uh, crowds being back in, in the stadiums. And so I am weighing a little bit more to some of that home field advantage um, because it gets really loud. Like that whiteout game was just absolute madness and chaos. And I loved every bit of it. And so I weighed a little bit more to Penn state and it ended up coming through. But I mean, I'm focusing more on those smaller spreads. Once you start getting to like the 14s and the 17s for favorites, especially there's a lot this week but in particular. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's like 21 point spreads or higher on like three quarters of the game. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot. And I don't want to touch those whatsoever. Do I want to? I take underdogs because I think they can win. I'm not taking an underdog because I think they'll lose by 17 instead of 20. Right. So let's talk about one of those games that uh, is is not a huge point spread. We have Wisconsin and Notre Dame at Soldier Field in Chicago. Right now, FanDuel has Wisconsin as a six and a half point favorite. Jack Cohn is playing his former team. So he's either going to show Paul Chris that he should have won the job or we'll see that he transferred because he couldn't win the job. So what, what, are, you, what are you seeing in this game? I see no value in this game. <laughs> One other thing that I kind of I love to do for college football is stay away from the marquee matchups, the Alabama, the Florida, the Notre Dame, Wisconsin. These are the games. These are the games of the week every single week. These are the number one games that the sports book are paying exact attention to. So I think Notre Dame could lose by five. I think Wisconsin can win by seven. Like I think it's that close to call. But I would lean to Notre Dame at plus five and a half here because Notre Dame they haven't faced a run team and Wisconsin, they haven't faced a strong passing team. So both of these stats, both of both, both, <laughs> both of these defensive stats are skewed to both sides. And there's not one single thing to differentiate. Neither of them have like a solidified strength or weakness in their offense or their defense. So I think you have to look into the further details. And the best that I could find was turnover margin. And Wisconsin is top 25 in turnovers. They have a minus three turnover ratio. And he has a, they have two quarterbacks right now being utilized for Wisconsin in Mertz and Wolf. Zero passing touchdowns and three interceptions. And Notre Dame is a top 40 team in takeaways. This defense for the Irish have forced five interceptions, one fumble, and 13 sacks. I think that's going to be the difference maker. And I know that Wisconsin is a run first team, but I want to have a quarterback who can at least put a, a passing touchdown instead of three interceptions. So my lean would be here to Notre Dame plus five and a half and come out with the outright win. Well, I think that the interesting thing too here is you're talking about staying away from marquee matches because sports folks have a lot of attention on those games. I feel like it's even worse when it's Notre Dame specifically, <laughs> because if any team is going to be getting notoriety outside of a marquee game, even it's going to be Notre Dame. Yeah. So I feel like you're probably just staying away from all Notre Dame games in general then, correct? Yeah, probably. Um, I think like, yes, I will say there was one underdog. It was last season when they were playing against UTSA. And I was like, I loved UTSA last season, and they were, I think, like 18-point underdogs. And I was like, I think they can win this game. And they lost the game by, like, six. <laughs> and, I mean, you look for, like, I would always play – if you are playing these, te these teams, I'd always look to the underdog rather than to cover big favorite spreads.
because that's where the market is going to go to anyway. So like right. Wisconsin at home, the line already ticked up. You said it was at, uh, or it's, it's changed a little bit. It went yeah. from, what was the, the It was five and a half to, it's now six and a half. So it is, it does seem like, it, despite it being Chicago, which is a pretty no-name heavy city, Neutral. it does seem like yeah. there's been action on Wisconsin there. Exactly. And I just think, I'm never going to try to guess what the books are doing. I just right. know that they, the lesser teams, the Mac teams, those are the ones they're not paying attention to. The one that is like advertised on every commercial that has like a pump up video and a hype video for social. <laughs> those are the ones that I want to stay away from because more often than not, those are going to be like damn near exact lines on both the total and the spread. But you're, if you're telling me that Wisconsin opened five and a half and it's now six and a half, I like Notre Dame even more on this spot. All right, perfect. Let's move now to Texas A&M versus Arkansas. This one's in Jerry World out in Dallas. Uh, Texas A&M, five and a half point favorite. Total here is 47 and a half. You got Zach Calzada starting here. And it seemed like he, when he came on initially in relief of Haynes King, didn't look that great, but looked a bit more comfortable in his first full game as starter. Obviously, lesser opponent there. But how are you looking at Calzada here? And how does his starting impact your view of Texas A&M for this game? AM is always going to be that weird team for me. <laughs> I cannot, and this has been for years now, I cannot get AM right. Every time I bet on them, I'm wrong. Every time I bet <laughs> against them, I'm wrong. <laughs> so you you find those teams where you just sometimes you just can't figure out, and that's okay. Um, I think Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin, I think Arkansas and AM, though, the, historically, these two teams have really always played tough against each other. These are generally low scoring games. And if you look at these offenses this season, it looks to be another low scoring game this time around because neither of them are have ex any type of explosive offense. You're talking about a backup quarterback. Um, I think Arkansas here is in a really good spot to contend against AM. Their defense, they're, they've always been a strong defensive team. And I, there's nothing that says differently that that's going to be changing this time around. Um, I would be looking to Arkansas, not only just on the plus, but I would be looking at, to them to win outright. And definitely looking at the under is definitely worth an option here. Yeah, I mean, Arkansas, look at them. They're run first team. They're six right now in rushing offense. And a and is shown to be vulnerable against the run. You want to give me a team that is has a strong defense, who is, has the ability to slow down the clock, um, I like Arkansas as home underdog here, plus five and a half and plus on the money line is what I would be considering. Excellent. Uh, let's move on to our third game. we got Kansas State at Oklahoma State. Uh, Oklahoma State's a six and a half point favorite, total 45 and a half. Both these teams are three and oh. Uh, which team do you think com comes out ahead here? Uh, this is a exact, this is a perfect example of these two teams have played nobody <laughs> both of their run defenses they're both top 10 in rushing defense except if you look at the scheduling neither have them neither of them have played a rushing team they're playing teams who are ranked 90th or worse in rushing offense so yeah they're going to look like a top five run a uh, run defense neither has faced a run team so the question becomes who's going to defend the run better when both of their offensive strengths is the run um, I think this is going to be like a great game to watch. This line is something is one that has moved. It opened up at seven and it's now five and a half. I would definitely want the seven for the underdog, but the value was lost from seven to five and a half. I definitely think that Kansas State can win this game. But if you're talking about being a long term winning sports better, you want to get the best number. And right now you're not getting it. And I do like K-State to come out with the outright win because they're playing so strong, even without their quarterback in Thompson. Um, it That situation doesn't bother me because they're a run first team and the strength. And he wasn't even like a leading rusher on the team. So that's always a benefit. And they're two, the running backs that they have, the defense that they have, Kansas State is definitely a contender here, but you're getting the worst number at seven to five and a half. If this number cre creeps back up to six, six and a half, if, I mean, I doubt it would get um, – go back up but if it does if it happens to go back to the way of the underdog i'd be looking to k-state but at five and a half this is gonna stay away from me and purely because of the line move yeah and i think it makes sense especially with seven being such a key number i mean less so in college than in the nfl but like that's a big number to move off of and that does make a, a massive difference there for k-state and oklahoma state so those are the marquee matches but as you said pamela you know your main focus is on these lesser games, games that may not have the full attention of the sports book. So where are you seeing some value on the board this week across college football? The only game that I have highlighted that I really do like is Liberty minus six at Syracuse. 
Um, I typically don't like to take favorites, <laughs> but <laughs> sometimes it makes sense. I'm an underdog better by heart, but sometimes taking the favorite does make sense. And Syracuse, they have one of the worst offensive lines in all of college football. They've allowed seven total sacks. It's coming over from every year they have a terrible offensive line. This year is no different. They have two quarterbacks, and combined they have just two touchdowns and three interceptions. So that's always something that you want to consider if you're fading, a, fading an underdog. And the Flames, they have the fourth best pass rush this year. They have already 10 sacks um, accumulated by the defense, 11 interceptions. And Syracuse has just one player with over 100 rushing yards, and that's running back Sean Tucker, who accounts for six out of 10 rushing scores. So you have one player that you can ha- that the defense really has to focus on because they don't have a quarterback that can do anything. And Liberty, they definitely have the better quarterback. They have the better run game. And Liberty, I mean, quarterback Malik Willis, have you seen him? He's so good. He's so good. He's so fun to watch. He has seven touchdowns, zero interceptions. He leads the team in rushing yards, but they do also have two other running backs that have uh, 100 yards of rushing or more. I think that the Liberty claims here can definitely cover the six and win by double digits. Yeah, Malik Willis got a lot of offseason buzz with regards to the NFL draft stuff for entering this year. So uh, Willis, a guy that the pro scouts are in on, and Pamela is in on him as well. That is Pamela Maldonado. Make sure you check her out on Twitter at PamelaM35. Make sure you check, it out, check her out on Yahoo as well. Pamela, we appreciate the time. Oh, so much. Good luck to you, not just with college football this week, but also on the NFL side of things. And hopefully we'll, we will talk to you here once again soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Pamela Maldonado for swinging by and breaking down week number four of college football, giving your thoughts on some marquee games. And then we talked to Pamela about Notre Dame versus Wisconsin. Uh, that game is at Soldier Field. I think I was there the last time Notre Dame was at Soldier Field. I don't know if that was the Miami game or not. I'm not sure if that was the last one. But I was there for that one. I wore a Northwestern hoodie for some reason because why not? I had no other no. wardrobe functions I could possibly wear. So Home field. Yeah, exactly. Why not? You're you uh, and your your you and your hoodie. I know, just just me. Uh I was there with Notre Dame fan at least. So it wasn't totally like random, but it was uh had a good time. So we'll see how that goes for this week. You've got thoughts on that game too. Again, uh it is now Wisconsin minus six and a half. How are you viewing that game? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I like Wisconsin here. Coming into the season, I had Notre Dame as one of my overrated teams. This was on the preview series of the Football Analytics Show, and you know, Notre Dame's had a ton of success making two college football playoffs in, uh, over the last three seasons. But unlike most teams, they lost a ton of talent on both sides of the ball, including uh, quarterback Ian Book. And so now they have Jack Cohen, who transferred from Wisconsin, and, and we have this nice narrative. And, you know, Cone was pretty solid in the first two games, but kind of struggled against Purdue. Uh, They had a 25% passing success rate in that game, which is significantly less than the college football average of of 39 and a half. So Notre Dame took advantage of three long touchdown plays. Um, Kind of these explosive plays are are not really something that you can rely on uh, in college football. Some analysis that Bill Connolly did. And the game could have been a lot closer. You know, Notre Dame ended up winning by two touchdowns, but by the underlying metrics, uh, it was a much closer game. So, so far, you know, my, my system of adjusting Notre Dame and my prediction system has kind of a, has adjusted Notre Dame down uh, almost four points from where they were in the preseason. So it would agree with this idea that they were, they were kind of overrated in the preseason. You know, Wisconsin, on the other hand, they started with a home loss to Penn State, um, but it, they did have more yards and they had a better success rate um, in that game. And, you know, as Graham Mertz ended up throwing two interceptions late as they tried to mount a comeback, uh, Penn State ended up winning 16 to 10. You know, I my numbers like Wisconsin by eight. I do see value in this game. Um, Preston Johnson, professional sports better. He's been fading Notre Dame the entire season. I think he's seeing a lot of the same things that my numbers see and downgrading them. I got this at five and a half yesterday. Uh, I still think there's a little bit of value at six and a half. Probably not so much if it gets any higher, but uh, I think I think Wisconsin gets this done on the neutral site, and um, yeah, that's what I'm going with. So your numbers have eight. What would your numbers say if it weren't a Jack Cohen revenge game? Would it be like Wisconsin <laughs> by like 30 at that point? Because I feel like the revenge game's got to be worth like at least 15 against the spread. No, I, I, I no, I, I, I don't. I don't really think the revenge game. I mean, 
I mean, who knows what the narrative is behind that? But. I mean, hey, Terod Taylor, all, he almost got the Texans a victory last week against Cleveland. Ed, if you don't believe in the power of the revenge game, I, I can't help you, man. That's, that's just yeah. all we got here. All right. So you're betting Notre Dame? Is that, no, what, is that absolutely what not. No, I can't touch college right now. <laughs> I've had been laser focused on the NFL, so I've got nothing there. But I think that um, a point and a half is still enough where I can see some some value there. But just kind of make sure you shop around. Try to identify the best number there. Um, I think that the Wisconsin – Michigan game next week should be pretty fun. So yep. looking forward to talking more college football as we go along here. Are you fully caught up now? Cause I know that it was kind of a, a rough process earlier on. Have you had time to, to get fully, you know, like caught up and then get some sleep or is it still a work in process here? Uh, it's still definitely a work in process on the college and the rank of a matrix didn't really want to be what it was supposed to be. So I had some issues with the adjusted success rates this yep. week. So, uh, yeah, you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, okay. I think one, once I have the success rate adjusted for opponent, um, either later this week or early next week, I will feel ready to, to really talk about it. And, and it's probably fine just because, you know, three games is not really a lot to go on. Right. So I'll feel more comfortable when we have, you know, when we get to five, six games, then yeah. we can probably start making some conclusions from that. And we get to some bigger games coming up, too, because this week is kind of a weird slate as well. So looking forward to more college football discussion going forward. My covering the future for today is going to be an NFL one. We'll get two NFL ones this week, one today, one tomorrow. And I want to get the Packers at plus three and a half against the 49ers. It's a three and a half right now, and I'm not sure it'll stick at three and a half. So I wanted to talk about that one today as my first bet for this week. And I get why things are so high for the 49ers, because they look great the first two weeks, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that their first two games were against the Lions, who are, you know, your your favorite dumpster fire, Ed. Uh, and then the Eagles, not sure how much of that is, uh, you know, how much that week one win is predictive going forward. Those two teams ranked 30th and 24th in my power rankings right now. The Packers are not. Uh, they're ranked seventh, right in line with the, the 49ers up in fifth. So my numbers respect the 49ers a lot both based on my priors and based on what they've done so far. But I still respect the Packers a lot too. The Packers main weakness as a team has always been stopping the run. And that would typically be frightening against a Kyle Shanahan team, but they are super banged up right now. Raheem Mostert out for the year. Michael hasty is out. Trey sermon is on the wrong side of questionable. Eli Mitchell may play, but he hurt his shoulder as well. And that should help the defense be less of a train wreck as it was in that a the NFC Championship game a couple years ago where the 49ers ran for like 1,600 yards in that game. And I do think the Packers offense can do well here too. The 49ers corners are a weak point for sure. Elton Jenkins is playing left tackle in place of David Bakhtiari. He's looked pretty good over there. I think he should be able to hold up against a pretty solid defensive line. So my numbers are the Packers or the, the 49ers favored by 1.4 points here. So... I'll take the Packers plus three and a half, getting the three there. I think that does help. And I feel good about them in this spot. And Ed, you were on the Packers last week. We'll talk more about that uh, in covering the pass for tomorrow. But I still feel like that week one stink is here. And it makes sense because like they didn't play great in the first half of, yes, of last week's game either. But I think three and a half to me is a bit surprising given how high we were on the Packers coming into the year. Yeah, it is a little bit surprising. Um, I would have made this pretty much essentially a push in the preseason the system you know my system moved pretty hard against green bay after that that first week loss so uh it's definitely on the side of san francisco i think the other thing that you want to consider here is that san francisco doesn't have their top two cornerbacks and you saw jalen hurts going after that last week in that football game with with a little bit of success and uh yeah, it's just it's really hard when you when you don't have your top cover guys back there. So I think that's another situation that plays into this game. And I kind of don't know what to think about Green Bay's defense. Like I feel like yeah. they have the tools in the secondary, but they're they're really not stopping teams. Um, I gotta think that gets better, but we haven't seen it yet. Yeah, we have not. And it is concerning because Jimmy Garoppolo has his faults, but he can he can quarterback an efficient offense. It's not may not be because of him. Uh, but it does happen. Like he, his offenses tend to be efficient and that's concerning. We saw Jared Goff move the football against them in the first half before the game script got out of control on Monday night. And we, but I think the good thing here is we saw the Packers offense exploit a weakness on the, on the lions when their cornerbacks went down. So wow. 
I do think, yeah, yeah I mean, like, you know, <laughs> different situation <laughs> for sure. Um, but I think that they should be able to move the football here. So I feel pretty good about the the Packers in this spot at, at plus three and a half. Ed, could you catch a pass on the Lions secondary right now? Yeah, I could. You know, <laughs> You've got really, speed. What? You've got the speed. That helps. <laughs> no, it's interesting. Um, you know, they got a couple of young kids, but that AJ Parker kid is grading out pretty well with PFF. Mm-hmm. So I would kind of joked around that, you know, losing Jeffrey Okuda might result in an upgrade. <laughs> According to PFF so far, that's happened. Obviously, they got some other issues back there right now right, as well. Right. Uh, with some additional injuries. Uh, but yeah, let's, we, we'll get into that more tomorrow. We certainly will. We'll talk about that tomorrow. We have our NFL show with Ariel, Ariel Epstein. We'll preview week number three there. But that is all that we have for today on the college football edition of Covering the Spread. Once again, a big thank you to Pamela Maldonado. Check her out on Twitter at Pamela M35 and check out all of her work over at Yahoo. A link to her writer profile is up in the episode description up on numberfire.com. Check out all of her work over there. Uh, Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah. Uh, so members of the Power Rank get access to all of my best predictions, uh, both college and the NFL. Well, when I look at the air from my college football predictions uh, compared to the markets, they've actually there's been a smaller air so far this season. It was a pretty strong week three. So hoping to continue that. This is the new model that I developed last year uh, out of necessity. And it seems this updating system seems to be more aggressive in changing teams. We talked about Michigan, how they're up to 10th already. Um, that's not aggressive as, as Bill Connolly, but uh, so yeah, it, it's a system that that I'm pretty excited about right now. So you can get all my college football predictions. Uh, so check that out. You can check out more about becoming a member at thepowerrank.net. All right, thepowerrank.net to become a member over there. Follow Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I'm at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Once again, we are back on Thursday to break down NFL week number three with Ariel Epstein. If you want to check her out tonight as well, she's on Girls Who Bet with Aaron Kate Dolan and Olivia Moody, a couple of people we've had on the podcast here before. So all of them in one place, night 830 on the FanDuel YouTube page to break down week number three in the NFL. More on that coming up tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. What's up, guys? This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.